Okay, so imagine um, a tiny little nanoparticle, like mm -hmm. something totally out of science fiction, you know, mm -hmm. making its way through the bloodstream, delivering medicine. Or think about, uh, you know, how scents just spread through the air, molecules just dancing around until they reach your nose. That's diffusion. And it's happening, like, all the time, all around us. Oh, it is. It's a fundamental process in so many areas. It is, yeah. So today we're going to explore... Um, the fascinating science, I guess, behind how these particles move and spread in fluids from like the tiniest little molecules to like, you know, larger particles. We're also going to um, unpack, I guess, a really important equation that helps scientists understand this whole process. It's called the Stokes-Einstein equation. Yeah. Perfect. I'm ready to, uh, <laughs> to dive in. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is diffusions? I feel like I have a pretty good general idea, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. At its core, diffusion is simply the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. It's driven by this natural tendency for things to spread out and reach a state of kind of equilibrium. Okay. Makes sense. So it's not just like things dissolving like sugar my tea. Right. right. It's happening constantly in like countless ways. Think about like how oxygen moves from your lungs into your bloodstream or how nutrients spread throughout like a plant. It's all about particles trying to even themselves out across space. Okay. So this constant movement, seeking balance. Now, I know from experience that some things diffuse like way faster than others. My tea definitely cools down way faster than the sugar takes to like yeah. dissolve. What factors affect the rate of diffusion? Well, one of the most important factors is temperature. Okay. The higher the temperature, the faster those molecules are moving. And the quicker that diffusion happens, think about like how much faster sugar dissolves in hot water compared to cold water. It's because those sugar molecules are getting bombarded with like more energetic water molecules, and that's helping them spread out faster. That makes sense. So heat really does speed things up. What about the size of the particles? Does that matter? Absolutely. It's all about how easily those particles can move through like the surrounding medium. Larger particles experience more resistance as they're trying to jostle their way through. Yeah. So they tend to diffuse slower. Think about the difference between trying to move a beach ball through a crowded room, like a really crowded room, versus a tiny little marble. That marble is going to zip through those gaps a lot easier. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. So it's like an obstacle course for the particles. Mm -hmm. What about the medium itself? Like, does that play a role? Oh, definitely. Okay. The viscosity of the medium, basically how thick or resistant it is to flow, is a key factor. Mm -hmm. Imagine like trying to swim through honey versus water. The thicker that substance is, the more difficult it is for those particles to move. And the slower the diffusion. It's like they're trying to wade through molasses. So it's all about that resistance, isn't it? Um, is there anything LSE about the medium that matters? I know diffusion happens differently in like air versus water. You're right to point that out. The nature of the medium itself does play a role. Diffusion happens fastest in gases where the molecules are far apart and they can zip around really easily. Makes sense. It's a bit slower in liquids where those molecules are more densely packed. And in solids, well, diffusion can be incredibly slow, almost like things are frozen in place. So those gas molecules have a lot more freedom to like roam around and spread out. Mm -hmm. Now scientists must have a way to like quantify how fast a substance diffuses mm -hmm. in a given medium, right? Exactly. They use something called the diffusion coefficient. Okay. Which is essentially a measure of how quickly a substance spreads out under specific conditions. So if we think of diffusion like as a race, the diffusion coefficient would be like the speed of each runner. That's a good way to visualize it. The units might seem a bit odd, like area per unit time, but it basically tells us how much area those particles are covering as they spread out over a certain amount of time. So a higher diffusion coefficient means like faster diffusion. You got it. And now we can get to the really interesting part, the Stokes-Einstein equation. Oh. It's a powerful tool that allows us to actually predict and understand this diffusion coefficient. Ooh, sounds intriguing. I'm ready to hear more about this. The Stokes-Einstein equation is particularly useful when we're dealing with spherical particles diffusing in a fluid it brings together a bunch of different factors, the size of the particle, the temperature, the viscosity of that fluid. Hold on. So we're assuming that these particles are like perfectly round. Yes. For this equation to work accurately, that's one of the underlying assumptions. But before we get into like the limitations, let's break down what the equation actually tells us. OK, sounds good. Lay it on me. Well, one of the key components of the equation is this thing called the Boltzmann constant. It's this incredibly tiny number that connects the world of energy 
with the world of temperature. Okay, I remember hearing about the Boltzmann constant, but remind me, what does it actually represent? Think of it as a sort of universal translator between energy and temperature. It helps us understand how much those particles are like jiggling around due to their thermal energy. Okay, so it links how much the particles are moving with the temperature. What else does the equation um, take into account? Well, in addition to the Boltzmann constant and the temperature, it also factors in the viscosity of the medium and, of course, the radius of the particle itself. It's basically saying that all of these factors contribute to how easily that spherical particle can move through the fluid. So it's like a recipe for diffusion with all these different ingredients playing a role. I like that. And by like tweaking these ingredients, changing the temperature, changing the viscosity of the fluid, we can actually predict how the diffusion rate will change. For instance, if we increase the temperature or we reduce the viscosity, that generally means a higher diffusion coefficient, which means faster diffusion. So this equation gives scientists this powerful tool to predict how particles will behave in all sorts of situations. Before we get into the applications, I'm curious about the equation itself. Like, how did scientists even come up with this? Was it like a sudden eureka moment or like a more gradual process? It's actually a really beautiful example of how science builds upon itself. The Stokes-Einstein equation comes from combining a few key concepts. One of them is Stokes' law, which describes this drag force like a type of friction that acts on a tiny particle as it moves through a fluid. So those particles are encountering like resistance as they try to navigate through the fluid. Precisely. Now we also have to consider the random thermal energy Energy that's making those particles jiggle around constantly, what we call Brownian motion. Oh, yeah. I remember that from school. It's like those particles are constantly doing this little dance. Exactly. And the Stokes-Einstein equation essentially emerges from finding the balance point between this drag force from Stokes' law and the thermal energy that's driving that Brownian motion. So it's a tug of war between these forces. And the equation tells us how that struggle plays out in terms of like diffusion. That's fascinating. It really is. And now, are you ready to explore some of the incredible ways this equation is used in the real world? Absolutely. Let's dive into those real world applications. Let's start with something I find particularly fascinating. And that's how the Stokes Einstein equation helps us understand like the inner workings of living cells. Okay, now we're talking. I'm always amazed by how much complexity is packed into something so tiny. Exactly. And one of the key processes happening inside cells is the movement of proteins, you know, those tiny little workhorses that carry out all sorts of essential tasks. They need to move around, interact with each other, and get to specific locations to do their jobs. And diffusion plays a crucial role in all of that. So it's like a bustling city inside each cell with all these proteins like rushing around to different destinations. That's a great analogy. And the Stokes-Einstein equation helps us understand the like traffic patterns in this cellular city right. by considering the size of the protein, the viscosity of the cytoplasm and the temperature. We can model how quickly these proteins diffuse through the cell. So we can predict like how long it takes for a protein to travel from one part of the cell to another. Yeah. Why is that so important? Well, it's crucial for understanding all sorts of cellular processes. Wow. For example, how cells signal to each other, how they transport nutrients, and even how they fight off like invaders like viruses. Wow. Knowing the diffusion rates of different proteins helps us understand how these processes work and what might happen when they go wrong, like in diseases. Wow. So this equation is giving us a glimpse into like the fundamental processes of life itself. It really is. Now let's shift gears and zoom out to the world of nanotechnology, where we're dealing with things even smaller than those proteins. Okay, so we're talking about, like, manipulating matter at the atomic and molecular level. Right. I know nanotechnology is a hot field with, like, tons of potential applications. How does the Stokes-Einstein equation fit into all of this? Well, one of the most exciting areas in nanotechnology is designing drug delivery systems. Okay. Imagine tiny nanoparticles, like miniature submarines, carrying medicine directly to specific cells in the body. That sounds straight out of science fiction. But how does the Stokes-Einstein equation help design these, like, nano submarines. Well, to design these systems effectively, we need to understand how those nanoparticles will move through like the bloodstream or tissues. Okay. The Stokes-Einstein equation allows us to predict their diffusion rate, which is crucial for controlling where and how quickly the medicine is released. So we can use the equation to make sure those like nano submarines reach their intended target and don't just like drift off course. Yeah. 
Exactly. And this precise targeting has huge potential for treating diseases in a more effective and uh, less invasive way. Wow. We can minimize side effects because the medicine is only going where it's needed. That's incredible. It's amazing how a seemingly simple equation can have such a profound impact on medicine. It really is. But I'm guessing there are challenges, right? The human body is a pretty complex environment. You're absolutely right. Yeah. The Stokes-Einstein equation gives us like a great starting point, but it does have limitations, particularly when dealing with the complexity of biological systems. Okay, let's talk about those limitations. What are some of the things that might make the equation less accurate in like real world situations? Well, one of the key assumptions is that those nanoparticles are perfectly spherical. Right. In reality, they often have like more complex shapes, which can affect how they move through fluids. So our nanosubmarines might not be perfectly streamlined. Exactly. And then there's the assumption that the fluid itself behaves in a simple way. The equation works best when the fluid's viscosity stays constant, but many fluids in the body, like blood, are non-Newtonian. Their viscosity can change depending on the forces acting on them. So it's like trying to predict the movement of a boat in a river where the current is constantly like changing and swirling around. Precisely. That would make things pretty unpredictable. And these are just a couple of examples. Right. There are other factors that can complicate things like interactions between the particles themselves or with the surrounding environment. So it sounds like while the Stokes-Einstein equation is a powerful tool, we need to be mindful of its limitations, especially when dealing with, you know, complex systems like the human body. Absolutely. But despite these limitations, it's still an incredibly useful tool for understanding and predicting diffusion in a wide range of contexts. Okay. It's helped us make incredible advances in medicine and other fields. It's amazing how something as seemingly simple as the movement of particles can have such far-reaching implications. It really is. I'm eager to hear about more applications. What other fields has this equation impacted? So we've talked about, like, Cells and medicine. Where else does this equation come into play? Let's step into the world of polymers. Those long chain-like molecules that make up like a huge variety of materials. Okay. From plastics and rubbers to DNA and proteins. Okay, so we're talking about the building blocks of like so many everyday objects. Exactly. And the Stokes-Einstein equation is incredibly useful when we're trying to understand how these polymer molecules move and interact, especially when they're like dissolved in solvents. Well, it's like watching those long wiggly chains navigate their way through a liquid. I love that visual. And the way those chains move and interact has a huge impact on the properties of the materials they form. For example, a polymer that diffuses quickly in a solvent might create a more flexible material, while a polymer that diffuses slowly might result in like a, a more rigid or viscous material. So scientists can actually use this equation to like design materials with specific properties. That's right. They can predict how changing the solvent or the temperature will affect how the polymer chains move and ultimately how the material will behave. It's like having a toolkit for tailoring the properties of materials to fit a specific purpose. That's really cool. It's like having a recipe book for material science. Now, I know we've talked about the um, limitations of the Stokes-Einstein equation, but it sounds like it's still incredibly valuable in all sorts of fields. Are there any areas where scientists are like, pushing the boundaries of this equation, trying to like refine it or make it even more useful? Definitely. One exciting area of research is developing more sophisticated models that can account for some of the complexities we discussed earlier. Okay. For example, researchers are working on models that can handle non-spherical particles or fluids with like changing viscosity. So it's like taking that like classic equation and giving it an upgrade. Exactly. And these refinements are opening up like exciting new possibilities. In drug delivery, for instance, scientists are using these advanced models to design nanoparticles that can navigate the complex environment of the body even more effectively, maybe even reaching specific cells with pinpoint accuracy. So we're talking about even more targeted treatments with fewer side effects. That's amazing. It is. And beyond medicine, these advancements are also having a huge impact in material science. Scientists are using these refined models to design polymers with incredibly specific properties for all sorts of applications, from like self-healing materials to super strong composites. 
It's incredible to think that something as seemingly simple as the movement of particles can have such a profound impact on so many different areas of like science and technology. It really highlights the power of understanding fundamental principles. And as we continue to refine our understanding of diffusion and develop you know, more sophisticated models, I think we can expect even more groundbreaking discoveries and innovations in the future. This has been such an eye-opening journey. From the basics of diffusion to like cutting edge applications in nanotechnology and material science. I feel like I have a whole new appreciation for that, you know, intricate dance of particles happening all around us. It's been a pleasure exploring this fascinating topic with you. And hopefully our listeners now have a deeper understanding of the hidden world of diffusion and the powerful science that governs it. Absolutely. And who knows, maybe this has sparked some curiosity and inspired our listeners to see the world around them in a new light. Noticing the subtle but essential process of diffusion at play in everything, from a drop of ink spreading in water to the complex machinery of life itself. That would be fantastic. After all, science is all about asking questions, exploring the unknown, and constantly seeking a deeper understanding of the universe we live in. Well said. And on that note, we'll leave you with a final thought to ponder. What if, instead of just observing diffusion, we could actually control it? What if we could manipulate the properties of fluids or the shapes of particles to direct the movement of molecules with incredible precision? That's a fascinating question to consider. It opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for like engineering and manipulating matter at the nanoscale, potentially leading to new materials, new technologies, and even like new forms of life. The possibilities are truly mind boggling. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the fascinating world of diffusion. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep those brain cells buzzing.